Stay tuned to the very end to hear about a special offer from this episode's guest. For most musicians, and I guess this is applicable across the arts, it is the constant wrestling between something that is your passion and how on earth do I pay the bills. I quite quickly clocked that I preferred teaching adults. I just tend to prefer the banter of dealing dealing with adults. They will say things like, this is judgment-free. This is a judgment-free way to learn. You can feel the benefit of having a hobby like this entirely separate to, are you any good at it? They are two different questions. Hi, I'm Claire, founder of Open Stage Arts, Drama and Singing Classes for Adults. For this podcast, I chat with people who have found or re-found their creativity as adults. We'll explore their childhood experiences of the arts, discuss how they came to the artistic practices they now love, and consider the barriers they may have experienced between the two. We'll also explore what it is that people value and gain from their newfound artistic pursuits and how their creative lives enrich their practical, necessary, everyday lives. For this bonus episode, I'm speaking with Mark Deeks about how he can help you tap into a particular form of creativity in a whole new way and without judgment. Hi, Mark. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Your contribution to finding creativity is in helping others. How do you help grown-ups pursue a particular strand of creativity? So I'm a massive believer that many times adults have blocked off the possibility in their mind that they would ever have a musical hobby, usually because of something they were told as a child. Your fingers are too fat. You are tone deaf. You will never be able to do that. It is too hard. It takes years to get any good at that. There's no point. Do do your maths exam. And one of the things that makes me really upset about that is they've been told that on the basis of what it might take to become a professional at that. When in fact, what they actually wanted to do was just have some fun. So there are countless people in the universe who... If I had a quid for a time and you want to said to me, oh, I always wanted to play the piano, but I'd, I'd be on a beach. And it's just, it's just really sad. People have spent 30, 40, 50, 60 years of going, I always wanted to play the piano, but... And, and the rest of that sentence is something that just isn't true. All the rest of that sentence is something that has been established in their mind on the basis of something they heard as a child or something they've heard someone say during their life but that is the context of becoming a professional at it. And they don't want to become a professional piano player. They don't want to be a professional singer. They want to be able to chill out with a musical hobby after they've put the kids to bed, after they've come in from work, on a weekend instead of something else for 10 or 15 minutes. And that's a very, very different conversation. It's a very, very different conversation. It frames everything completely differently. You don't need to practice as much. In fact, I don't even tell you to call it practice. Call it playing. There's a change for a start. And it, it's uh, I just encourage people to use it in the same way as they might mindfully approach anything else. You know, the language we use around going for a walk or the language we use around yoga or meditation. Or... Music's the same. Why, why we've had to sort of make it this all or nothing, you must be a professional or there was no point, is beyond me. So, yeah, that's what I help do. I help, I help grown-ups to do. I help people who have had a lifetime of thinking I'd like to be able to do that and have decided they can't do that based on something which is just not the point. Oh, brilliant. Tell me how music came into your life. Was it um, in childhood, in education? Well, there was a piano in the house when I was a kid. My mum and dad had both attempted to play and both failed in their own ways. (laughs) So my dad can play in one key, which is actually musically a very difficult key. Uh, without being able to read or write a note of music. You can can play by ear in one key, in one of the last keys you should be able to do so. It makes no sense. My my mom had taken lessons when I was extremely young because she'd always wanted to do it and found it really difficult. I started lessons when I was five. Apparently, I was sort of transfixed. As a child, I could reach the keys and I could get a a noise out of it. So, you know, this was entertaining to a, a little boy. So when I was five years old, my parents were like, well, well, perhaps we should let him have a go at some lessons and see how he gets on. And I wasn't forced to go. I just thought I'd see how I got on. 
And then uh, my mom always tells the story that when I was six, I was better than her, so she gave up. And so it was only uh, literally now in her 70s that she's become one of my clients. I don't charge her for the record. <laughs> she joined my membership, and uh, now she loves it because she's, she feels like she's found a way that she can just do it for fun and she can relax and she can watch the videos as many times as she likes. She doesn't have to haul herself to a lesson every week. And so, yeah, uh, I didn't have a... A musical childhood as such, although there was there was a piano in the room, I seemed quite interested in it, and it, it seems to come pretty naturally to me. And I sort of rattled through the grades. and uh, Yeah, I got my grade 8 when I was 12, and here we are. Did you want to pursue that after education? Were you going for a, a musical, continued education or a musical career? My mum quite often tells the story that people would say to her sort of quietly in the street, oh, are you going gonna to let him sort of study this at like A level or university, or I'm just like, well, yeah, he seems to enjoy it. He seems, seems to be quite good at it. So why would you not? There was always this air, I think, that some people will identify of, um, you know, what are you going to do for a proper job? <laughs> you know, a lot of creative arts people have to sort of ride the gamut of that line of questioning. In fact, I don't often share this story very much. Why is this story popping into my mind? I remember being about 14 or 15 years old at a break time or lunchtime at school and this boy who I thought was really posh I went to quite a posh school and I hated being at a posh school I didn't hate being at a posh school it was great in a lot of ways but I really didn't I wasn't one of them like we weren't rich at all I'd had to get like this blazing scholarship to get in uh, so I was quite I'd come from a very sort of quote unquote normal background but that, so I was surrounded by a lot of kids from a lot of wealthy families and this boy said to me like what, what do you want to be when you grow up and I really wanted to be a DJ I really wanted to be a radio presenter and I said oh, I wanted to be a DJ, uh, which of course is you know quite a creative thing and being involved with music in that way. And he literally said to me, you know, "No, for a proper job." And I got him up against a wall. I, it's the only time I've been violent in my life. I've never been violent before or since. But I just totally saw red at this. I mean, I didn't hit him or anything. I sort of like pushed him. I was like, "What do you mean a proper job?" Just because I don't want to be a lawyer. Yeah, I had this little sort of burst of teenagey angst for about five seconds, and then it passed. Yeah. I, I, always, I guess I always wanted to be around music in some way because I, I just seem to understand it. You know, I'm awful at loads of other things. I have terrible practical skills in terms of like, I can get lost in a box. You know, I just I can't work out how things work. I can't fix things. I can't mend things. I can't put a picture on the wall. My DIY skills are non-existent. I get lost in the town I live in, much to my wife's total amusement. I mean, my dream job would have been to just write about football, but yeah, I never really pursued that. I just give my football opinions to anyone who listens so <laughs> which unfortunately is my wife and she doesn't like football so that's a different story <laughs> um but uh yeah music was all I really understood it always seemed to be the path that I was destined to go in, in some form how did you do that then what did you do after you finished school so I did a popular music studies degree which in the mid 90s so I was 96 I went to university it was quite an unusual thing so popular music education was quite a new thing at that point uh, music education until that point had been, you know, very sort of classical and traditional based, I guess, in many ways. But, you know, in the mid 90s started to see popular music courses starting to arrive. There weren't many in the country. So I ended up going to a place called Bretton Hall, which was part of Leeds University, based at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And then what was the plan after that? And did it go to plan? I don't really plan. I don't know what a plan is. I have no plan, really. Much to everyone who comes into contact with me, frustration. I have far too creative a brain for plans. I have huge difficulty with fiction. So I don't understand fiction. I deal in reality. So the the the, the concept of visualizing something that isn't real yet just doesn't work in my brain at all. So I just, I have an idea and then start working until it happens. That That is how my brain works and has worked on everything. So, I mean, I've got a PhD in heavy metal music, which is, you know, everyone thinks it's hilarious because you know what's the point in that it's, it's difficult to disagree but i i needed to know what the last point of that was before i could even start writing it i need to know what the point is i need to know what the the goal is in terms of you know what is the last sentence almost i remember being like that at school when i was having to write science experiments and that's i knew what the point of it was i couldn't even begin uh, and when i know what the point of it is then i'll just start working but planning is a really alien concept to me i don't i don't understand fictional books or films I would, like if I never watched another film in my life it wouldn't bother me because it's fiction like, well, it's not real so what's the point if it's a real story now I'm interested but if it's fiction it's just not how my brain works I, I realize on a creative podcast that's quite a revelation but uh, music works to me like I can talk music till the cows go home but 
um, I struggle to visualize stuff. Like if someone, when someone says to you, imagine you're on a beach, but I'm not. So how can I do that? So my brain just doesn't work in that way at all. Visualizing is just a really foreign concept to me. That's really interesting. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> it's really frustrating. I'm playing piano blindfolded. Imagine how frustrating that is. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's where my brain is. Amazing. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. So without any plans or any foresight then, how how did your musical co- career progress? And tell me what you've enjoyed and what you haven't enjoyed. For most musicians, and I guess this is applicable across the arts, is that it is the constant wrestling between something that is your passion and how on earth do I pay the bills? And so... I remember sitting in a a class at university, which was a class, it was songwriting on the surface, but the the conversation had sort of gone off the rails. But the guy said to me, um, if you got the phone call tomorrow to be the keyboard player for the Backstreet Boys, because the Backstreet Boys were huge at the time, to be the keyboard player for the Backstreet Boys on a tour, and they're going to pay you £10,000, would you do it? And I was like, no, absolutely not. I want to make my own music. I want to be famous, be famous for my own music. You know, this is, you know, my, you know, it's my creative thing kind of thing. And and the the thought of selling out as it is always the expression of selling my soul to the devil and taking the money for playing keyboards for someone else, particularly, you know, someone who wasn't cool. But of course, then you leave university and you're like, oh dear, I need some money. It's the constant wrestling, isn't it, as an artist, uh, for want of a better expression of, do we follow the dream or do we, do we take the work that makes, pays the bills? And so... I always describe my career as, as a traditional musician's career in reverse. So most musicians will, when they're young, attempt to try and make a living out of their, their music in some form, write songs or being in bands or getting their bands and trying to get some gigs or selling some CDs or you know, when CDs were a thing. And most musicians will attempt to do that for a bit because you know they've got the young dream and they've got the fire in the belly and off we go. And rightly so, like do it, absolutely, why not? And then they'll go, mm, this is quite hard, this. Unless, unless they've had some kind of real break. Most musicians will go, this is really difficult to make a living. What else can I do? At which point, most musicians will then fall into teaching of some form or another, be it instrumental teaching, be it classroom teaching, you know, university lecturing, whatever it is. There will be some form of teaching. You're sharing their skill. And most musicians will then use that as at least part of their income for the rest of their lives. I did the reverse to that. So I'd I'd started piano teaching when I was 15. So by the time I got to the end of university, I was a bit bored of piano teaching. I got offered my first proper, in inverted commas, teaching job just a few weeks before I finished my degree. And it was 18 quid an hour. And I went, well, yeah, why would I not take 18 quid an hour? Um, And it was a total fluke. I was in the staff room of my music lecturer, who was a, a great lady from Trinidad and Tobago called Geraldine Connor. And she was famous, actually, for doing the Carnival Messiah, which was the Caribbean carnival version of Handel's Messiah. And she took a phone call from the local music teaching service. They were desperate for a singing teacher uh, because their singing teacher had gone on a cruise ship to sing and just left them in the lurch. And so I happened to be in the office when she took this phone call. And but when she was being asked, do you have anyone who could come and help us out? And she sort of waved to me and said, wait there, wait there. And uh, said, I've got you a job interview when she put the phone down. So wait, what on earth for? I'm a piano player. I haven't taught, taught singing in my life. What are you on about? And uh, she said, oh, you'll be fine. <laughs> so I rocked up at this interview. And the first thing he said to me was, can you play piano? I said, well, as it happens, yes. Now you're talking my language. He said, well, great, you start Monday. And that was it. Believe it or not, I've coached choirs for the last 23 years. <laughs> So I ended up being a singer teacher first and sort of gradually saying, but by the way, I actually can do piano teaching as well. Perhaps I should do some more of that. So yeah, that, that was how it started. Oh, amazing. That's so funny. Did that continue in the same vein? Not not as one-to-one singing teaching. I did it for a few years, but I, I never felt comfortable in the, being a one-to-one singing teacher because I, I had no knowledge of like proper singing technique and you know breath control and the mechanics of the throat and the voice and whatever. I could coach performance. I could teach people to sing in terms of a performer aspect. And that's always how, what I've ended up doing. You know, I, I've spent the last 23 years coaching community choirs. I've got my own singing company called Sing United, which is my community choir in Newcastle. We've got 150 singers. Yeah, arranging for choirs is, so, is something that's ended up playing a huge part in my career because I really love being around the energy of people who are doing it just because they love it. They feel it. 
these are not professional singers. These are Joe blogs from ordinary jobs. They just have a passion for it. And you can't bottle that. That's something that you can't inject into performances. There are plenty of professionals who are weary of the slog and they just perform because they know how to. And they might be great at it and they may well be very talented, but sometimes they're not feeling it. And when someone feels the music, now it's got 10% you can't teach. And so being around community projects is really exciting like that. I've worked with uh, choirs of all sizes. I've conducted 300 singers and an orchestra at the same time. And that's a thrill, let me tell you. The Royal Northern Symphonia at the Sage Gatehead, 300 singers, the Inspiration Choir. Good stuff. Does does your soul good that? I mean, it's hard work. Like, don't get me wrong. I was, I was a little flustered. I a lot lie to you, but yeah, it was great. So um, yeah, community singing has ended up forming a, a huge part of my career. And now you want to help adults play the piano as well, as you've already mentioned. Why do you think grown-ups in particular might need your help? Well, I guess it's like what we were talking about before. So, I mean, I, I've played piano all my life and it turned out that I was all right at showing other people how to do it. And as I say, I, was starting, I started doing one-to-one piano teaching when I was 15. But I quite quickly clocked that I preferred teaching adults. I can teach children. I have taught children. I just... I don't particularly want to teach children one-to-one. I just tend to prefer the banter of dealing dealing with adults. But I guess through my sort of late 20s and into my 30s, I fell a little bit out of love with piano teaching one-to-one, even when it was adults, just because, you know, adults are busy. Adults are busy, and they're going to come up with a thousand and one excuses for why they haven't practiced that week. And that's just a really tedious conversation after a while. I sort of fell out of love with one-to-one teaching for a while, and then sort of wondered whether I could do something online and, and, and coach people in a group in some way. And so, you know, thankfully I did that pre-COVID. So I kind of had a head start on lots of other music teachers who were suddenly going, oh God, I've got to take my you know, my music teaching online. So I set up a, a membership in, in the end of 2019 uh, called Piano Legends. And I love it. You know, this is like my baby now. So it's basically pre-recorded videos. So I can record the content anytime I want. Obviously, we do live Q&As. We do live masterclasses and stuff. But the bulk of the content is pre-recorded. People can access it anytime they want because they're just paying a small subscription to access it. And they will say things like, this is judgment-free. This is a judgment-free way to learn because Mark can't see me unless I want him to see me. No, we have a members group. That's a huge part of what we do. And I encourage them to post videos of their playing so I can give them feedback and you know just prop their phone up on the end of the piano or on a book or something. I don't need to see how tidy your house is or how much makeup you've got. And just show me your hands and I'll tell you whether it's any good or not. But it means that they can watch when they want, watch as many times as they want. They don't feel stupid about asking questions because they just watch the video again. I, I, I never need to know. Um, and then when they're ready to like say, oh, well, yeah, I've, I've done this, even if it's just a few notes, great. We're not trying to make a professional out of you. As I said at the beginning, this is about having something that's fun and going, oh, would you look at that? I've played this Elvis tune or whatever. It's really nice to have that community and the community aspect is a huge part of it. In fact, yesterday we just started what we call the piano amnesty thread. The piano amnesty thread is, right, let's get the confessions out of the way. Who's not playing? Why? What are you doing too much of? What what, what are you frustrated at? Let's get it all out in the open. It's just a a less pressured way to do it. And if they haven't played the piano for three weeks, they haven't played the piano for three weeks, you know. It's life, kids, family, jobs, it happens. So, but let's see if we can uh, find a way to sort of, as a collective, support each other. And it's not just them having direct access to me. It means that the others can go, oh, yeah, it's great that you've done that. And now I'm inspired to go and have a go at this tune. And, you know, that community aspect of it really helps because learning an instrument can be a really lonesome thing to do. As I guess it can be in any art. There's a lot of solitary work involved. And, uh, you know, having that community aspect is, is a really, really huge part of it. I approach it in in the language of well being. You know, let's let's not have the pressure to be amazing at this. You can feel the benefit of having a hobby like this entirely separate to are you any good at it? They are two different questions. The success of your skill is not what results in the is this doing you any good. You get the you get the better of it first. You know, I've got complete beginners who report sleeping better within a week. I've got in fact, a lady, I cleared it with her that she was okay for me to share this because she said it publicly, So, but I checked with her. Her eating disorder has stopped since she started playing the piano. She was binge eating every day for a year, then started playing piano for 10 minutes a day and hasn't binge eaten in six weeks. I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, and I, I'm always clear to say, I don't cover this from any kind of medical training whatsoever. This is nothing to do with my medical knowledge. I don't have any music therapy knowledge. I'm not a therapist. But I know that if 
I can help people to put music into their lives in an unobtrusive, positive way that is not dependent on success. And I know that I have countless anecdotal evidence from people saying, this is the impact it's having on my life. And that is separate from, are they any good on the piano? And that's a really important distinction to make. Sounds absolutely fabulous. Sounds like such a joyous and fun and safe way to do it, to uh, to tap into uh, your own musical energy. How can people contact you and find out more? Brilliant. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's a choice of two ways. If you're someone who likes a book to dive into, then I have a book called Not Another Piano Book. And the subtitle is How Everything That Stopped You Playing Like a Piano Legend So Far Shouldn't. And it's not a book on how to play the piano. It's a book that dismantles every reason that you haven't done it yet. It's a motivational book. There's a little bit at the end, which is like, now you can start wiggling your fingers like this kind of thing. I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that, but there we go. Uh, But the, the general concept is, here are all the stories you've told yourself. Here are all the things that you've heard about learning the piano. And here are all the reasons that they are nonsense. So let's just dismantle them. So if you're a book reader, uh, not another piano book at notanotherpianobook.com, which is a nice, easy way to remember it. Alternatively, if you just want to have a go, you say, well, that sounds like something I'd like to have a go at. Even if you haven't got an instrument, then just send me a message on Instagram and we'll get you set up. You can have a go for free for seven days. See if you like it. And if you don't, then at least you know. But don't wonder. You know, don't wonder about it. Just do something about it. And if it's not for you, great, that's fine. Go and draw or, or take a poetry or whatever it is you might want to be. But um, it's something that's worth having a go at and at least finding out. And if you don't have an instrument, send me a message. I've got all kinds of links ready to go for beginners. Don't let the cost put you off. Because people think you need to spend thousands of pounds on an instrument to make it worthwhile. You just don't. Like, the links I've got set up are like 200 quid and you're done. If you don't have 200 quid, it's fine. Start saving. Or... Send me your postcode on Instagram and I'll tell you what, what's available in your local Facebook marketplace. I do that for people all the time because I just don't want there to be any barriers. Like, let's let's get over the barriers. And let, if, if you're the barrier, I'll sort it out. Fine, let's go. So if you'd like to connect with me on social media, then look for Mark Deeks Music or use the hashtag ThatPianoGuy and you can find me on uh, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and indeed on Clubhouse. Mark Deeks Music or that piano guy. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. If you contact any of the artists featured in the podcast, sign up to their workshops or buy their products, don't forget to mention Creativity Found. Creativity Found is an Open Stage Arts production. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please feel free to subscribe, rate and review. If you would like to help fund future episodes, visit ko-fi.com slash creativity found podcast. If you have found your creativity as an adult and would like to talk to me for future episodes, drop me a line at claire at openstagearts.co.uk. On Instagram or Facebook, follow at creativity found podcast, where you will find photos of our contributors artworks and be kept abreast of everything we're up to. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about that special offer. Mark has very kindly offered listeners of Creativity Found £50 off his Piano Startup Academy course. Simply visit thatpianoguy.club and quote the coupon code CREATIVE50. And enjoy!